one of our viewers had most of his capital tied up into two growth stocks. Of course, he has been slaughtered in the latest sell-off and he sent us an email asking us what should he do in this situation. In this video, I will go over the email and then we will give him our opinion on his question. <music> Today we are doing something a little bit different on our channel. We got an email from one of our subscribers on the channel and he asked us some questions. And um, after Justin and I went through it, we believe that there's actually a lot of people that can benefit from this. So first of all, if you have something similar or if you have a question, please remember to reach out to us. Um, our details, of course, are, is on the about section on our channel. And you can also go to um, globalmoneyacademy.com to the contact page where you can send emails to us directly. And of course, last but not least, we've got the comment section that Justin and I actually handle personally as well. So it's always either Justin or I that get involved in that. So with that being said, Justin, let's dive into this email real quickly. So I think a lot of people can actually um, relate to this. So this user said that, oh, by the way, we're keeping it anonymous. So um, he said that I started investing when I was 27, 27 years old during the financial crisis in 2007 to 2008. Luckily me, without knowledge, I, I earned a lot of money and I built a house with my earnings. Big mistake, I stopped investing following the market. After investing a lot in the construction of my house, I started again on the stock markets in January 2020. Still thinking I was a hero in the stock market, I invested a lot in the beginning. Luckily me, I sold everything just before COVID started and again, I had a nice track record. But then I kept buying during the bull run and invested a lot of money. As a believer of tech and biotech, I, I, I am slaughtered since then. I am still a big believer in e-health e and biotech, but my portfolio has crashed in stocks like Teladoc and Moderna. For sure, I have stocks in companies like Microsoft, Microsoft Alphabet, ETFs in S&P 500 and the MSCI China, but I wanted to ask your opinion. What would you do when you are in my situation? I am down 55% in Moderna, 75% in companies like Teladoc. Reinvest or keep the money for companies like Amazon, Meta, Snap, Nokia, Alphabet. Moderna and, Tele and Teladoc are the biggest positions in my portfolio. I know I'm not smart. So shame, I think he's, he's being a little bit hard on himself for saying he's not smart. But um, look, all of us make mistakes. And unfortunately, like Justin, and I always say we love looking back, back at our mistakes because we always learn a valuable lesson from that, you know, rather doing it now than later in your life when you build up a lot more money. So um, I think to me, the key is looking back at those mistakes. But with that being said, we've got the situation, Justin. Let's discuss this today. Yes, yeah, so I think I think, first of all, kudos to um, this person for being very self-critical. I think it's important to look at your mistakes and be open and honest. I think that's the hardest thing of all. So, you know, that's the first thing I want to say. You've, you've acknowledged some of your mistakes. You've also acknowledged that some of the stuff that you've done has been, you know, without, without any real strategy. There's been a little bit of luck involved. Um, so I want to I want to make mention of a couple of things that I think are important because you know I think you are we are today because of a series of decisions and and processes that would have put in place before you actually got to this point today. So you know the first thing is obviously two thousand eight two thousand seven you made a little bit of money and you chose to put that money into a house. Now you know a lot of people say that's probably not the worst decision. A lot of people say that's an appreciating asset and you probably don't regret it because you've got a roof over your head. And so, you know, you probably feel good about that decision. I would argue, however, it's probably not the best financial decision you could have made. Um, and I would I would use this as a lesson, right? And I think there's a better way to deploy caps on. And, and I've made the mistake, and I know certainly Davi's made the mistake. And I think it's important to look back in this and just see this as a loss of opportunity that potentially it's something that you could correct in the future. If you make money again, don't make the same mistake again. Remember that uh, your primary residence is not an asset. It's an, it's an asset in terms of accounting, in accounting sense, but in terms of an investment that generates cash flow, it's actually a liability because it's a net uh, outflow of cash. So unless you're generating income off the property, it's not the best investment. That being said, you know you probably did you probably did better than ninety percent of the people. You put money into your house rather than going and you know spending it on something else like cars or whatever else. So that that's a good thing, but. I think Davi we could both agree in terms of deployment of capital, especially money that you've made in the markets, the best thing you can do is to continue compounding your investments. So if you make money in the markets, the best thing you can do is figure out how to keep making money in the markets. And I'd say 
one of the reasons you probably lost momentum is because you didn't have this burning thing in the back of your head. How do I keep growing my wealth? How do I keep deploying capital? And so what happened is you stepped away from the markets and you went and you built a house. And I think that is potentially where you lost a little bit of momentum. And Davi, you and I talk about this a lot. It is so important once you've got momentum, keep momentum because momentum is the hardest thing in the world to get. Once you lose momentum, it takes forever to get back to. So I don't know if you've got anything to say on that before we get into the actual stocks, Davi. Before we go ahead with this video, here's a free offer we would like to extend to all our viewers. If you would like to learn more about money, investing and creating wealth, go to our website globalmoneyacademy.com where you will get access to all of our courses, calculators and stock sheets for free. We have got courses covering stock market investing, real estate investing, even creating your own online business. You don't have to take out a credit card. It is all absolutely free of charge. Simply go to globalmoneyacademy.com to get access now. Now back to today's video. Yes, look, um, I, I was in pretty much a similar position as, uh, as him. Um, when I was 26, I bought my first um, primary residence and I I made the mistake of paying it in full. And that was that's probably one of my biggest regrets, you know. So um, I took my money, my excess cash, and obviously there was quite a bit of it, but I put all of it into, into the real estate, into the house, you know. So looking back at it now, I would have done it differently. I wouldn't have um, put my cash into the house. I would, have, I would have taken out a loan to do that because obviously I was earning enough money to, to afford the loan, you know. Okay, but Davi, Davi, sorry, can I just interject very quickly before you go any further? I have to say this. Davi, you are exceptionally good at managing money. So this is not advice we universally give to everybody. Mm. We're going to preface this by saying only do this if you're really disciplined with money. Yes, and if you if you are earning enough, obviously, if I yep. could afford to pay my house in full, I was earning enough, you know. So and yep. I and I had a lot of money um, that I had um, uh, saved up as well in the process. So um, that was a little bit of a different thing, you know. But um, then he says, then he stopped, then he got into the market, and I think the before we get into the stocks, I think what he's looking at is is an is opinion from us and um, assuring him everything will be okay. But I think if you I think that's also one of the biggest mistakes people make is, is looking at, at the short term. So look, I've got stocks where I'm down uh, what about 70%, 60%, you know, one of which, which is Coinbase. It's still in my portfolio. Um, I haven't sold it because I bought it for different reasons. It was a play on, on, um, on cryptocurrencies. And at the moment, the tech sector is very, very much beaten up at the moment. Um, the same with cryptocurrencies. I think we can all agree that cryptocurrencies does go in correlation with, with equities. So um, especially with growth stocks, I think. So um, look, I think if uh, looking at the short, if you look at it at a short term picture or from a short term picture, then obviously you're going to be freaking out. So I'm sitting here, I'm not freaking out because, well, to me, I'm taking it, um, I'm looking at from a long term picture. So I think with that being said, he probably wants us to go into the stocks and he probably wants our opinion on those. So, so Davi, I think there's one fundamental difference. I mean, I've got my, my largest uh, loss in my portfolio as a percentage is Coinbase. I'm down 76%. Uh, my second largest one that I'm down is Coupang is 62%. However, having said that, they are also both the smallest positions in my portfolio. The big mm. difference for this user in particular is that it's his two largest position. And the two largest positions constitute uh, two major, major uh you know, losses in terms of percentages. And so, you know, the question here is, do you ride out the storm? Uh, do, you, do you start looking at selling? What do you do? Like, like what, what, what is the answer here? And, you know, I've got an opinion on things. You're probably going to have a slightly different opinion on things. So let's start with you. If you were in this person's situation, if you were in his shoes, your two biggest holdings were down 70% plus what would you be looking to do? Also, especially considering the industry sector, right? So we are talking about Teladoc, which is a stock we spoke about yesterday quite extensively. And, uh, and, and of course, uh, Moderna, which is a stock we've covered quite a bit here on the channel as well. So the first thing I would do is I would go to those two, the two stocks and I would go back to the drawing board, do extensive due diligence because, I mean, the fact that he, all, that he asked the question means that he probably doesn't know too much about the stocks. It was probably more of a like an impulse thing that he acted on. So I would go and I would do my due diligence properly on the company. From there, I would sit down and ask myself, will this, do I think this stock will be around for the next um, 10 years? You know, And if I, do, if I do think it will, then I will most probably wait for, for the tide to turn because obviously this isn't the tech sector at the moment. It is very beaten up at the moment. 
Um, yeah. Moderna, I don't know. I don't know that much about Moderna. Um, that's obviously also um, in the health health sector, you know. Um, it's not a sector I personally invest in. But Teladoc, um, yeah, a lot of people will have different opinions on it. And we've done a um, video on Teladoc as well. So maybe a good point of reference will be to go back on that. But that's personally what I would do. So I'm also sitting with my biggest position being down a lot. And that's because of the regulations in China that happened. I'm not freaking about it out about it at all because I have done a lot of due diligence on the company and I believe the company is great. I believe the underlying investments are great and I believe the companies are going to be around for the next 10 years. So personally, I'm not selling my investment because I'm pretty comfortable with what I own and I do feel pretty comfortable about the picture changing in the future. But um, look, obviously, so that is what I would do. I, I would go back to the drawing board, do extensive due diligence and then ask myself, listen, yeah, is it going to be different? Because now, obviously, if you sell now, you are selling at a loss, you know? So that is the other question you want to ask yourself. Do you want to sell at a loss when um, when you are sitting in a sector that is completely beaten up at the moment? So, so Darby, I'm going to give a totally different set of answers. And, and, this, and, and this maybe comes from, from having, having been in a very similar situation many, many, many times before. So I think the first question that this person needs to ask themselves is, how badly do you need the money? Right, that's the first question. Mm. If you if you really need the money, then you need to ask yourself how much money do you need, right? And put down that amount on a piece of paper. Then you need to ask yourself how can you get that money without taking the least amount of losses, right? So let's say for argument's sake, in this in these stocks, let's just take a dollar value. Let's say you've got let's say you've got twenty thousand dollars invested in these two stocks, and let's say you you're down seventy percent. But if you go and look at the at the times you've bought in, let's assume you bought in multiple times and you've dollar cost averaged in, you're probably going to find on some of those trades you you've you've got slightly less of a loss, right? So you, you may be in at less of in less of seventy percent of a loss on some of those trades. So what I would do is I would sell out on those positions and take a little bit less of a loss. So maybe you take a sixty percent haircut versus a seventy percent haircut and try and get the money that you need. This is if you need the money, okay? Get the money that you need. That's, that would be my advice, if you need the money. Get the money that you need, relieve yourself of the stress, get back to sleep and get back comfortably at night, okay? That would be my first piece of advice. So if you need the money, figure out how to get the money out of your, out of your positions with the least amount of losses. So that's the way I would do it. I would go back and I'd go open your positions and see which have incurred the, the least losses and close those positions get the cash that you need. Now let's go to the other alternative. The other alternative is let's assume that um, you don't need the money right now. You're comfortable sitting in these stocks for the next couple of years. You've invested money that you know, you're not needing to call up for the next four to five years. My next piece of advice would be backing up something that you said, Davi, which is to go back to the drawing board and to, to do some real due diligence on these companies again. But I would preface that by saying something completely different. I would challenge you to go and find a reason not to invest into these companies, okay? Because what you're gonna do is you're gonna go in there with confirmation bias. You're gonna go in there and you're gonna try and convince yourself to invest into these companies. And it's like Charlie Munger says, um, always do the inverse. Always do the inverse, okay? Go, go into these stocks and try and find the reasons why you shouldn't invest into those stocks. And if the reasons why you shouldn't invest into these stocks, it's what we call the risk factor. If the risk factor outweighs the reason why you should be investing in that stock, then again, I'm going to make the point I went back to earlier, which is getting out of the stock. Start averaging out of your position by starting with the positions you're taking the least amount of losses on, right? And just do it slowly over time. Now is the worst time to sell. There's no question about it, right? So definitely don't just go do this all at once. Take time. Do this potentially over the next two years. Do it potentially over the next year as the market moves. And what I would always say, and this is my, my third and final piece of advice on this, and Davi, you're probably going to chuckle when I make this statement because you've heard me say it many times. Um, you know, uh, it's better to take a loss on a piece of dog shit and trade it for something that's not a piece of dog shit, right? So ultimately what you want to do is you want to trade your crap stocks for good stocks over the long term. So my advice to you would be, irrespective of what happens over the short to medium, term, eventually what you want to do is make sure you go back to the drawing board and buy companies that you're going to be confident that when the shit hits the fan like it did in this market downturn, that no matter what happens on the market cap, you're, com you're comfortable and confident in the valuation of the company, not the market cap. 
okay? And irrespective of what happens to the market cap, even if the market cap gets slaughtered, you believe that the company has fundamental value. So even if, even if the market cap, and I'll use an example, if the market cap of Google goes down to five bucks tomorrow, I'm still confident that Google's a really good company. And I'm confident holding it through the next five years because I believe the company is going to be worth something, right? Um, you've got to find those companies to invest into because that's what makes me sleep comfortably at night. Davi, I know that's what makes you sleep comfortably at night. That's what makes every value investor sleep comfortably at night is that I don't, I don't open my portfolio every day and go, holy shit, I'm down 70% today. Or holy shit, I'm down on Meta. I mean, I'm looking at my portfolio right now. Let's, and I'm going to, um, I mean, Davi, you're welcome to bring up my, my screen if you really want to. I mean, I'm going to share this openly. My, 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 my investment into the S&P 500 is down 15% on, on, on my current investment. Uh, if I look at Nokia, down 17%. Microsoft, down 70%. Uh, Toyota, I'm down 23%. Intel, I'm down 26%. Guys, am I worried that Intel's not going to be around in 10 years' time? No. Am I losing sleep that Microsoft's not going to be around in 10 years' time? No. Am I, am I worried that the S&P 500's not going to be around in 10 years' time? No. So, you know, 15% down today and, and up 50% in five years' time, it's not going to make me lose sleep. Um, the problem is when you're invested into highly speculative instruments, when you're invested into highly speculative stocks that don't, that, that the fundamentals don't back up the current valuations. And the current valuations are catching up to the reality of what they should have been last year when everybody was buying into the hype. So my advice is, and I think Davi, there is no better way to explain this than to understand that value investors sleep well at night because they do the hard work when nobody else is prepared to do that hard work, which is they ignore the market cap and they look at the actual value of the company. And when you do that, you can sleep comfortably at night. And so my advice to this person, decide whether you need the money or not. And I've given you two scenarios and then figure out which scenario you're going to follow. But either way, over the long run, my advice to you is get into stocks that you can sleep on at night, irrespective of what happens in the markets. Yes, of course. I mean, I, th I think that's pretty good advice, Justin. Um, we, we cannot sit here telling him to, to buy or sell um, any stocks, you know, because... Yeah. Well, even you and I disagree with each other on certain companies, you know, and that's why your portfolio looks completely different from mine. But and but you have got your own thought process when it comes to investing in stocks and you have got your own way of looking at it and weighing it up against your risk profile, you know, and I've got exactly the same thing. So I think if you're undecided, um, I would say go back to the drawing board, just make sure you research stocks. And then the biggest thing of all is Try and learn from the mistakes you made, you know. Don't call yourself dumb. I mean, everyone makes mistakes. That's part of investing. You can't get it all right. If all of us could get it all right, all of us would be billionaires, you know. So unfortunately, that's just the way it works. But if you can learn from your mistakes, at least you won't make those mistakes again in the future. Yeah, and, and this is the thing about YouTube, guys. Everybody on YouTube, like, only wants to post their gains, right? Everybody only wants to talk about how much money they've made. Let me tell you something. I've lost a lot more money than I've made in, in business in general, right? Never mind investing in other people's businesses because this is what the stock market is. We're investing in other people's businesses. In my own businesses, I've lost more money than I've made, right? Starting business. I mean, Davi, you've been with me for a long time. We've started how many businesses that have failed and we found those few that have succeeded. It's the same thing in, in investing in stocks. Not everything you're going to invest into is going to be a home run. But this is, this, is, this is part of the game. It's part of the enjoyment of it. It's part of what makes this fun and interesting. And if there was a perfect formula, like you said, everybody would be a multi-billionaire. You know? And so you know, I, I, take exception to, I take exception to anybody like, and, and I've made this very publicly, you know, and I take exceptions to guys like Kramer, from mad money. I take exception to certain YouTube channels who speak as if they're an absolute authority on this stock is good and that stock is good. We try very hard not to push an agenda on any specific stock. I say these are stocks I believe in, these are the reasons why. But what we're not trying to push is a stock. We're trying to teach people the way we think about things. And in turn, not teach people to think the way we think, but to teach people to think about things in their own way. And, you know, Somebody might come from an accounting background and have an entirely different train of thought on stock investing than we do, you know, and that's healthy. It's good. It's constructive. And it's great because we always learn from those guys as well, you know, especially yeah. in the comment section. I mean, there's been a lot of um, things that I've learned from the from the from our viewers who have picked up something that I probably didn't didn't pick up, uh, pick up you know. Yeah. So I, I think that's also we need to get involved in, but also be careful of confirmation bias because that's also where a lot of people make a very big mistake, you know. So um, 
I would put my notes down in a notepad or whatever and then I think your biggest um, advantage would just be your own mind. Just sit and think it through, you know, instead of going to the comments. And look, money's a, money's a very emotional thing, you know, and, and I think that's the hardest thing for any investor to, to deal with is to separate yourself emotionally from your money. Um, I don't know how I'm able to do it, Davi. I've, I've, I've never really held emotion over money. Um, so for me, when I put money, money into the markets, I'm so emotionally detached from it. It, 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 it means nothing to me. I, I, I think it's because we it. have got more than enough. And, and like, even if, if, if our businesses has to close, you know, uh, like everything goes bankrupt right now today, which is very unlikely. But if that has to happen, you and I will both be fine because we, ha we still have a safety net. And I think that's where our emotions get attached, you know. So Dobby, we don't, I don't use know. our I, I, savings. I, I, I don't know that I agree with that. You know, there's a there's there's a saying that I've I've used for years in my life, and I've said, you know, money 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 amplifies who you are as a person, right? So, you know, the, you can tell a lot about a person with or without money. And uh, I think if you're fundamentally the same person with money and the same person without money, um, you, you're going to be okay in life. And I and I know you pretty well, and you know me pretty well. And I think whether you had a safety net or not you're never going to exercise emotion over money. I think there's a certain, there's a certain level of emotional yeah, control that you, that you learn over, over money. I was referring more to short term, you know. I mean, if you're yeah. sitting there with, with uh, and you're pretty much snapped, for, or, or, you, you've got a shortage of cash and you're being laid off or salary is reduced, then obviously that, you're going to make emotional decisions if you don't have money. No, look, f for sure, for sure. But, you know, then there's, a, then there's great examples of people in the world who have nothing in their pocket, but will still give the last cent in their pocket to somebody else. And I think, and I yeah. think the, the, point I'm, the point I'm trying to make is if you, can, if, you can, if you can learn to manage stress when the chips are against you and you can, and you can manage, uh, you know, the success of when you're making lots of gains without it going to your head, I think all of those are an equally important balance. And I think this is something I've been very lucky with when it comes to money. I've, I've never let making money go to my head and I've never let losing money get to my soul either, you know. And I think this is something which I've been able to detach from. And I don't know how to teach people that lesson, but I think no, you can't. it's a really important thing, you know. You know, there's a saying that floats around, um, investing is 90% ninety um, emotion and 10% um, uh, knowledge. So... Um, no, no, how true, how true that is. I, I guess you'll have to see over the long, over the long term how you how you did, you know. But I think that's only something that comes with experience. I don't think that's just something something you immediately wake up. It's it's something you have well, to teach Dobby, yourself you, and work you, yourself work on. If you keep your emotions in like me for uh, forty odd years, you land up with having no hair because you're busy, pretty much <laughs> you're doing this all day, and then eventually your hair falls out. So I think that's how we exercise emotional control. <laughs> <laughs> Probably, <laughs> but I don't know how true that is because I still got a full set of hair here. So <laughs> that is, don't, don't, don't come and talk nonsense. I see that receding hairline's moving back quickly. Eh? Nah, that's all. That's in the jeans. <laughs> <laughs> So listen to you. if you guys enjoyed it, please let us know in the comments below. Also, um, if you've got a similar situation, um, obviously, if you want to keep it anonymous, you can just send us an email you know, with your question and then we can address it. Um, obviously, a lot of people don't want to make certain things public, which is understandable. So if you don't want to get involved in the comment section, you can always mail us. So let us know if you have a similar question and then we can look at addressing it on the channel as well.